nine o'clock. Um, so welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Jesper Mitov Bergman. I'm the director here at AVT Business School, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes. After a short introduction, our main speaker, Mulray McLaren, will talk about clients, relations, and differentiation. Mulray's session will last about 25 minutes, and for the last five minutes or so, you, there will be a Q&A session. You can ask Mulray questions at any time uh, through the chat function. And if you don't want to see any other, uh, send out your question to any others, uh, please select host and panelist. Um, uh, and it's only us that receives your questions. In recent years, we have seen notable changes in relations between corporates and their external legal providers. Legal issues has risen higher on the corporate agenda as is the increasing importance of the in-house role. At a time when legal budgets are under increasing price pressures. So in this more ad hoc relations with external lawyers are therefore being replaced by new approaches, less use of external lawyers where possible, competitive tendering for work and a sharp downward pressure on fees. So against this background of a more competitive market, law firms express the new challenge in terms of better understanding the client requirement and defining and expressing their value proposition more effectively. So it's a great pleasure to have Moray McLaren with us today uh, to help us uh, understand the situation and what we can do about it. Because Moray has been uh, advising law firms for over 25 years, and he is a um, lawyer by training. Uh, he's completed an MBA in legal service uh, before assisting one of the London law firms on their global expansion. He's also uh, an associate professor at IE Business School, ABT Business School and a member of the uh, Muller Institute at Churchill College, University of Cambridge. And he's also an active member in IBA's Law Firm Management Committee. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, Murray, here today and uh, in a discussion about clients, relations and differentiation. Thank you very much, Jesper. Thank you very much for your kind words. Let me just share the screen. Can you see the slides okay? Yeah. So welcome everybody. I know we have a group that will be listening to us now and also we'll have a group that will be recording this. So uh, as Jesper said, do feel free to ask questions if you're one of the people listening live. So we're, we're going to be talking about change today. Changes in client relationships. But we have to really look at the, the wider context of where we are and why we're here. And what I'm going to be doing in order to do that, uh, my work is really helping high performance individuals and high performance groups, defining what they need to do to do well and how to get better. Within legal services, like many professional services, there's only three ways you can develop sustainable advantage. It's about your client relationships, your people. That is really what I've spent the last 20 years thinking and, and helping law firms with. But increasingly, we have this question about leadership. And I want to really look at this whole question of change in client relationships through those three pillars. There's a lot to cover. So I'm only gonna give you the headlines only, but do feel free to reach out to me or Jesper via LinkedIn, if you have any other questions. So, so let's start with the clients. And, and I think we have to really start with the pandemic, don't we? Because we know that the pandemic has been a, um, a medical tragedy. It, it's been a, a personal crisis for many, many people. It's been an economic crisis, but curiously within legal services, there has been a very, very different experience. 
So we've worked with a group of 40 law firms for what is now almost two years. The majority of law firms we work with have increased their turnover. The average is 10%. And they've increased their profitability by somewhere between five and 10%. But uh, uh, um, a lot of law firms have done much better than that. And when you, choose, when you take whatever letter of the alphabet you want to describe the economic uh, crisis we've had, is it an L-shaped crisis? Is it a T-shaped crisis? I'm quite fond of thinking the, of the economic changes K-shaped, because I see some sectors doing exceptionally well and others doing uh, exceptionally badly. In terms of the law firms, it has to be a Nike swoosh. So what law firms experienced was that first initial period of uh, surprise, challenge, change, but since then it has been a gradual rise. I was at the IBA Law Firm Management Committee conference in London on Friday with 200 managing partners. And it's no surprise that people were feeling glad to be alive. No, things have gone better than could have been expected. But let's be very clear. That doesn't mean to say that there aren't clear challenges. And it doesn't mean to say that the future is certain in any way. So I work with both in-house lawyers and I work with, with the um, external lawyers. This is one of the models we use when we try and understand. Clients have this build or buy option. They can either build the services internally and provide it, or they can buy it externally from law firms. And the way we unpack that is to think of, is it something on the, here in front of us on the y-axis, which is mission critical to the business? Or is it something which is legally difficult or not? And I'm only really going to focus because I've, I've got a limited time here on what we would call the value curve. Now the clients have spent the last 20 years trying to understand that value curve and the law firms are really catching up. In terms of the value curve on the top right, it's what is that really mission critical work where you'll need to get the top lawyer and you're willing to pay the top fee for that. And the bottom left is, what is that work that's increasingly becoming standardized? The work that was done by the most senior lawyers is now done by more junior lawyers. And this is very, very price sensitive. I do a lot of client listening when I phone up in-house lawyers and I had the very interesting conversation with an in-house lawyer that was working with one of the London Magic Circle firms. He said for the high value work, the Magic Circle worm, work, uh, firm was very, very cheap. And for the cheap work, they were very, very expensive. Now, throughout this period, in-house lawyers have been under an increasing amount of pressure for better, quicker, cheaper legal services, we know that. But we still see very, very clearly that they have had high value work that they've given to their external lawyers. In fact, from a client perspective, you've got that rocket science work, which is mission critical, and that standard work. Now, from the law firm perspective, isn't there something in the middle? Isn't there that relationship work the, the birth, the life, and hopefully not the, the death of the company. And the issue we've found over the last year and a half, and we saw exactly the same situation after the financial crisis following the 2008 um, financial crash, is at times of change and turbulence, that relationship work is squeezed. For me, it's a bit like a Coke bottle. Part of it pushes up to the top right, which is a rocket science, because they have Clients have such huge issues at times of turbulence and part of it pushes down to that standard end. Now, Jesper mentioned the word differentiation. So we have to be very, very clear here that if the client comes to you for that rocket science work, it is really about the reputation of the individual as being the leading expert in what they do. So if I fly into any of your cities and I land at the airport and I ask, who is the leading lawyer for this area of work? It's what is the name that I'm being told. So this is all about intelligence, ability, agility, 
and the reputation for problem solving. Contrast that with the differentiation required for that increasing, increasing amount of standard work, because that's about process. It's about management. It's increasingly about technology and it's definitely about engineering. So the requirements internally to build that in law firms and to sell that externally is very, very different. And the relationship, I mean, we've talked for the last 30 years about the trusted advisor relationship. I think the trusted advisor relationship goes through all of these, but it's so much more important for that anchor relationship in the middle. If I, if I land at your local city, and in terms of the, the medical profession, if I had a brain tumour, if I had cancer, I would want the person that could help me take that out. It wouldn't be price sensitive, but I definitely wouldn't have to have a relationship with that person. So we're seeing a huge amount of change around this. The good news for law firms is that rocket science is still there. That still is being paid per hour, uh, typically. And a lot of that work is pushing down to the standard work, which is a fixed fee, an annual, uh, a monthly relationship basis. Now, I wanted to share with you some data. So, yes, the clients are really concerned about improving effectiveness and efficiency, but that is nothing new. And in effect, a lot of the clients I interview, I interview about 200 clients every year they're not getting what they feel the service is required from their external lawyers in terms of innovation and change. So they've been doing that themselves. They have been working with technology providers. They've been working at their organization and structure in order to be able to provide that more efficiently. And, and as a consultancy at Lexington, we've been helping them do that. So we're talking about these different types of work and the client's perspective increasingly around which <clears throat> type of law firm to use for what type of work. As you might remember, 10 or 20 years ago, a client would use the one law firm for all of their services. But now they're increasingly seeing this market polarization and differentiation between different sectors. Which law firm has that reputation for being the best, that I'll go to the higher value, and where will I place that standard work? Because it typically won't be within the same firm. So firms have an increasing decision to make about their market position and, and where they want to be. Now, if you look at that rocket science work in every jurisdiction we look at, in every jurisdiction we work, that amount of law firms in that space is becoming much, much less. It's tougher at the top. And those at law firms that are able to provide better service, we'll talk about how and why they do that in a minute, are doing exceedingly well. A number of law firms and increasingly alternative providers across the world are looking to provide that standard work. I am surprised that there hasn't been more. And if you like, after we can talk about how and why there's less firms making a play for that standard work that can be so profitable, if you have enough of it. My worry is those law firms in the middle. They're unsure about their market position. They use language around mid-size, mid-market. And some of those law firms, I don't know if you know them, let's hope your law firm isn't one of them. They talk about full service. So in a market of increased polarization and specialization, Mid-size, mid-market, full service doesn't work anymore. Either what are the areas you feel you can be tier one, you feel you can make a play to be specialized, or how to embrace that lower value work. And the keys to success are going to be increasingly around understanding this. Who are the clients that you need to rely on that give, in, give your highest amount of revenue? We have revenue on the left here on the y-axis, and we have the clients providing that work on the, on the X axis. This is a very, very typical client fee tail because as we know around 80% of work will come from 20% of your clients. But you have to understand 
who are the current key clients you have to get closer to? That's the first question. Secondly, if you look to that far right of that client feed tail, there will likely be clients you're working for doing work which is unprofitable. So there's always going to be an, an aspect around cutting the tail. And I know law firms find this very difficult, saying no to some areas of work. And the third area of focus, focus will be the clients that are currently not your key clients, but could be going forward. You can look at this chart and feel very comfortable at the amount of work you get for your clients, or you could look at this and see the risk around those clients merging or going to other law firms. The difference between comfort and risk for me is the extent to which those clients are using a number of different lawyers in your firm and a number of different departments, because if they're not, you, these really important relationships could be at risk. And when we come to this point about differentiation, I remember being in a law firm 30 years ago when we knew our differentiation was very, very clear. It's all about being good lawyers, isn't it? The clients know we're good lawyers and the clients will continue to come to us because we're good lawyers. Well, if only it was that simple. Legal consulting is a black box. The clients get a document from us. The clients can't tell if one document is better than another document for a law firm. They'll only know if, that, if an issue comes off, if, if it goes to litigation. And in fact, all of the research suggests that it's not the drafting of the contract that in any way is a differentiation. It's about relationships. It's about trust. So clients have been feeling very vulnerable Clients have been feel, uh, struggling at the moment. And law firms that have done, have worked in this period of isolation well, have come out of this in a stronger position with much stronger client relationships. But it's been exceptionally hard to develop new relationships and to go into new organizations. So I've put some ideas on the left there for you on how partners and lawyers can work on that relationship and develop a stronger relationship. On the organization side, law firms have been incredibly inward looking and they have focused on their offices, they've focused on their practices. The only people I know as bad as law firms, and this is me talking as someone from a law firm, is the hospital. Because if I have a pain in my stomach and I go to the hospital, depending which specialist I ask, each of them will tell me I have something wrong with me. So a lot of our work at the moment is about how to ensure the client is at the center of the business. Part of it is a mental approach, but also part of it is the organization and structure. How do we move from service lines into sector specialization, which has been the main gain for the majority of law firms? What are the business sectors it makes sense for us to have a go at to get closer to clients? Not, not saying no to other sectors, but to focusing our expertise so we can talk about, talk the language, walk the walk in those sectors and help make the connections which clients want. I'll, I'll be very honest in a moment when we come to leadership and talk about why sector approaches are challenging. And in a moment, I'll also talk about why client key account management is challenging. But the extent to which a law firm can at least have the architecture in place not to communicate externally about service lines, but to think about sectors and clients. Now, I have to say I'm in a very happy mood at the moment because the law firms we work with have done exceptionally well. The headline so far is that clients have continued to pay money for top legal services. It's the people that is the biggest challenge within legal services going forward, because let's be clear, the whole of the model that we've seen in law firms, that um, up or out, sink or swim approach, has already been under threat. And all of the law firms I work with, one of the biggest pleasures of any partner in a law firm has been to invite the young lawyers into partnership. And over the last 10 or 20 years, we've had young lawyers that have said, actually, I don't know whether it makes sense to become partner. 
So that system was already, in my opinion, broken. But when it comes to the COVID aspects, of course, we all know people that have had a very, very good time during COVID. Increasingly, the more senior people, they converted their commuting time into billable hour time. They spent time with their families. They got to go running and walking the dog. And they all report back to me when I work with law firm partners, the good thing about working from home was I didn't have to deal with all that other stuff. Okay, stuff. Managing people, motivating, leading. So for some people, there's been a very, very positive time. For others, however, it's been exceptionally challenging. Maybe for people that are more junior, that don't have the large houses in the countryside, sharing a kitchen table, trying to work in more difficult circumstances, and especially for those with young children and all of the upset that there has been. So if some of the lawyers in your firm have been happy because they haven't had to deal with the other stuff, it's the other stuff that is now totally mission critical. And this for me is probably the, the one message and the one slide I'd like to, to take away and think about. In all of the interviews we do with senior associates, wherever they are around the world, they've been working very, very hard, a 12, 13, 14 hour day. They've often been working in isolation. They joined top law firms because they wanted to learn from the people they were with and they wanted to see their career path going forward. Those two particular motivations have been difficult for them. They've had the downside of life at a top law firm without the positive aspects. Good work is not enough. Good money is not enough. If we think that money is going to solve the problem to motivate our young people, like all of the law firms I work with that are looking at pay increases, that will not solve the problem of motivating your young people. The answer is on the bottom right of the screen. It's increasingly about purpose. So internally for law firms, it's that, what is the career deal for young people? What are the competences they require? And how are we going to communicate with them more clearly, more openly, more transparently about what's required? This is not a generation of people where you can say, if you work hard in five, 10, 15 years time, you might be promoted. They want to have much more clarity. And the competences around clients, that's now starting at the associate level. And the competences around leadership, delegation and supervision is starting much earlier. Because the deal is clear now, the bar into partnership is higher because profits are being protected in law firms. And unless someone has that business case and those skills, that pathway into partnership is closed. And let's come to the leadership aspect. If we're already aware of the challenges around people and clients, a lot of which have been there for the last 20 or 30 years, it's just at the moment they become mission critical, it's the leadership aspect which brings them all together. For me, the leader is the master of the orchestra, making the system work, making sure everything is in place in order to get to what, what, where you want to get to. If you look at this model for strategy, if you look at the market opportunities, we know coming out of COVID exactly what the economies will look like around the world. We know what the clients issues are. We know what their legal requirements are. We know what they'll be coming to your law firms for, for and we can plot that for the next three, five years. We probably can't go beyond five years at the moment. The issue isn't the spotting opportunities and that positioning and branding. The issue is really about the ambition of your individuals. What is it that your specific partners want to achieve? Because guess what? When I ask groups of partners now, have you, have you got a business plan for the firm? Everyone will put their hand up. Have you got your own business plan? Sometimes they laugh because they have a plan. The issue is that they're actually not 
implement, implementing it. And the gap between this opportunity and the ability to implement it, the key for me is really about ambition. And when we talk about ambition, I spent the first half of my career as a consultant going in and talking to a firm, imagining that it was able to define its ambition, its strategic purpose at the firm level. And of course you realize that there's different types of law firms where the partners who are incredibly autonomous and independent are collaborating in very, very different ways. In some firms, the partners are in their own canoes and they're paddling in different directions. In the majority, they're in separate canoes, but at least they're traveling in the same direction. But imagine the power of getting all of the partners into the same firm, into the same boat, I should say. So when we work on strategy, we have to really break this down into the partner aspirations. And unfortunately, because of COVID, it's been much more difficult for law firm leaders to talk to their partners and say, you could have gone to any law firm in this city. What brought you into this firm? What does good look like? What do you want? What motivates you? Because it's only by understanding the motivations of the individual can you really come to what is your requirement of the firm? You could really be any type of firm you want to be. The only challenge is, if you are a firm that's grown, where some of you have an ambition and your individual partners are not pulling in the same direction, you'll have the costs of the bigger firm without the benefit of collaboration, the benefit of cross-selling, the benefit of working together. So, just to finish off, I've got my last few comments to make. It does really start for me with the why at the moment. And I, this is the retreat season of the year when I go to partner retreats. And I used to go to partner retreats and talk about billable hours targets. We talk about profitability. And this year, the requirement among the majority of partnerships has been very, very different. It's coming together in a room, remembering why they're on this journey together thinking and sharing about the learning over the last year and a half, two years, and what that means going forward. So it's not just the young lawyers in law firms that are revisiting and rethinking what they're doing and why, it's the partners as well. And the ability to help those partners discuss and think more clearly about what good is and how you, how you achieve good is exceptionally important. Final point, some people tell me it's all about money in their law firms, but whether we think it's about the money or not, and from my perspective, it's very rarely only about the money, it's the extent to which the remuneration model is helping those lawyers pull in the same direction or whether it's holding them back. The question I always tend to ask is, what are the behaviors you require at the moment in your firm? And people will always tell me collaboration, cross-selling, developing people together, investing in the future. Secondly, when I say, what are you rewarding financially? Often it's about personal metrics and often it's about finance. So at the moment, a lot of law firms are very guilty of talking the talk on the collaboration, but financially rewarding very, very different behaviors. Um, I read many years ago, um, if you don't have a strategy for your law firm, how you pay people will actually become the strategy. Well, I would say from my own personal perspective, that even if you do have a strategy that you write down, how you pay your people will always be the biggest influence upon that. Conclusions and points to take away from this, well, on the client side, it's really, it's about focus, working out who are those key clients you have to get close to and how you're going to do that. What is going to be the architecture to organize and structure those, those key account management programs, that sector focus. And it has to be an, about investing in relations. Law firms have been very guilty about viewing clients as the ATM machine 
where they take out money and they really have to revisit that approach and really have to invest time off the clock in getting to know clients. People, this for me is my, my big concern. We really have to be less hierarchical in the way we approach legal services, both in terms of seniority, partners and non-partners, and also in working with business professionals. We cannot continue to talk about lawyers and non-lawyers in a world which requires top business professionals to help law firms get better. And let's be clear, there's a whole new agenda. Are law firms, are lawyers wanting to work from home? Can they work from home? How do we have work-life integration? I don't use the term work-life balance because work-life balance at the top law firm isn't possible. It's how do I integrate work and life together and what does that look like? And, and let's go back to this purpose and passion. Working as a lawyer isn't always easy. It's a lot of work, a lot of detail, a lot of hours. And if your people don't find their passion, it is just simply too hard and they won't be very good at it. And the final bit is that leadership role. There isn't really a career path for leaders of law firms, is there? Um, often people are pushed into leadership roles and they, they neglect and they leave their clients behind. They often de-skill because they don't continue doing work for clients. And it is really, really difficult to pull together a group of individuals and try and align them to a common purpose. So, that by way of my introduction was those thoughts. Jesper, what are you thinking after that? Are you feeling more positive about legal services or more negative now? <laughs> well, I'm always positive, so, uh, so, 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 so they're very capable. So it's, it's, it's a matter of action, I think. Um, we are running uh, a few minutes late, sorry about that. If you've got any questions, you know, just put in, we'll, we'll, we'll stay here for, for a few more minutes. But um, Moray, thank you for a brilliant uh, presentation. I, I, I was just, you, you know, also at the latter part of the presentation, you mentioned this people problem. You know, things are going so well uh, financially. Uh, so, um, but, but how, where, do, where do you see that starting in law firms? I mean, you know, you, of course you had to start at the partner level, but what, what are some of the triggers you see? Uh, is that that they lose money? Uh, sorry, that they lose people, some of the good ones, or, you know, what triggers a, a, a start of a discussion around what, what you do with, with the, the, either the business model or yes, the, yeah. uh, the, the people issue? Well, that, that's a very good point. I mean, I think it, it's better for people to have open and honest conversations continually, but within legal services, people find that very, very difficult. And especially during this period when haven't, people haven't been in the room together, they find it difficult to talk about what their aims and expectations are. So where, where a business would have clarity about what they're trying to achieve, law firms don't. The trigger is often, sadly, it's when a group of people leave, isn't it? Or when you find that your senior associates aren't staying. It is so difficult, that preparation on that, that path into partnership that we saw is so difficult that if you've invested five or 10 years in the career of an individual and they go somewhere else, that, that's really when the alarm bell should, should rhyme. The problem, Jesper, is how law firms have just been so profitable. And we were expecting a much greater degree of change, and we haven't had it yet, but looking forward, I think it's only inevitable that law firms have to review their, review their model. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for running a bit late. But uh, hopefully you've all enjoyed. We'll send out the recordings uh, of the um, webinar here. And um, we look forward to engage with you maybe on a later stage. But thank you very much, uh, Marie, and have a great day. Thank you, Jasper, for inviting me. And thank you to all the participants. Very good to see you all. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.